Hello and welcome to this presentation. I'm super excited to give today. My presentation that I am teaching today is how to reach your weight goals this year. So I'm so glad you're here. Whether you have never tried to lose weight before, you have tried everything under the sun, or you're just looking for some guidance, I'm happy to be here for you. This presentation was made to help set you up for success when setting goals, and we are gonna focus on weight goals for this presentation. This is the overview that we're gonna talk about today. We're really gonna dig deep into the five key points of weight loss. So finding your why, we're gonna talk about awareness, and then I'm gonna give you some general nutrition and physical activity recommendations, maybe some tips and tricks on areas that you can start when it comes to meeting your weight goals, and then we're gonna set those goals. So let's get right into it. And we're gonna start with finding your why. So you might have heard people reference my why before or heard somebody say that um, we need to find our, our why for the reason why we do things. And although it might seem trivial in a small step, this is one of the most important steps to take and to make sure that we complete when on a weight loss journey. So when we're finding our why, I really want you to think deep. Look deep within our heart and our mind as to why we want to lose weight. Step away from what you want to achieve, like that number on the scale, and really look deeper. Remember that our goals arise from our own desires and efforts to improve ourselves. So one of the ways that you might be able to find your why is to think about what your motivation is behind this. Maybe you have a family history of heart disease and you want to avoid that and you think by weight, losing weight, which is a good place to start, you might avoid that. Or maybe you want to see your kids get married. Maybe you're struggling with knee and back pain because of your weight, or you want to feel better in your clothing and feel a little bit better about yourself and how you're dressing, or you don't want to spend money on new clothes. What's really going to give you that burning drive to stick to your weight loss plan? Once you find that, I want you to write them down on a sticky note, a piece of paper, note card, and put them somewhere that will be, you'll see multiple times a day. Writing these reasons down of why you want to lose weight can first help confirm your commitment to yourself. And then by putting these in an area that serves as a reminder as to why you want to make the change will be a great impactful step and a reminder of why you're on this process or on this journey. So an example is by putting them in your bathroom mirror, like a sticky note on the corner of your bathroom mirror. So you see it multiple times a day, maybe putting it on the fridge. So every time you open the fridge, you see this maybe in the car, wherever it is to be a reminder to you. This step can be used for more than just weight management. You can use this for other processes too, or other journeys that you may be on. And although it is short and sweet, it is a it still is a large and very impactful step. So make sure you find your why before moving on in this process. The second step is to become aware. So once we dig deep and find our why, we're gonna start to look at what areas we think we need to improve. And not only that, but what areas that we're ready to make changes to. So I call this the cycle of weight management. When we go through our day to day, all of these things are impacted through our normal day to day. So I want you to start thinking of what areas you can make improvements on and then what areas are you ready to change? These are some of the ones that are very common areas that we can we can make and make effective changes to, especially when it comes to our weight and our overall health. Remember that we do not need to go all or nothing. We just need to make consistent progress. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's a, it's a story that I have definitely done myself. I actually, this is my own personal experience that I've done when I tell this story. And I want you to really think through and see if you have the same, if this has happened to you before, or if there are any areas on here that you think that you can make improvements to. So my example is that I could not sleep last night. My mind was running all night 
long. So I woke up late, I skipped breakfast, and I forgot to pack lunch for work. I chose to grab a bag of chips and cookies out of the vending machine to get me by until the end of the workday. I was so tired after work that I just went through the fast food lane and I didn't go to the gym, even though I know it makes me feel good and I like going. I chose to sit on the couch and watch my favorite show for far too long. And when I was close to the time that I should be getting ready for bed, I realized that I had some house chores that I just absolutely had to do. So I started to do these and I got stressed at how much I actually had to do. So I went to bed late again, and yet again, the cycle continues. As you can probably tell, as I already mentioned, these are, these are areas that we totally can change. We could have made a step to modify these, and they all impact our weight and overall health. So think back into if you've ever done this, if you've done it today, or what areas are very common for you to overthink, whether it be our nutrition, our exercise, behavior, stress, or sleep. And once you've identified those areas that you think that you could work on now, let's move on to readiness to change. So you identified some of those areas, maybe they're just very general. Now we need to evaluate our readiness to change and I'll give some questions or examples on the next slide. But when I talk about readiness to change, I always use the zero to 10 or one to 10 scale to rate where I am and how ready I am to make changes to these. So some of my questions would be, how motivated are you to lose weight? Rank it one to 10. Are you willing to change your eating habits? Rank that zero to 10, one to 10. And how willing are you to change your activity habits? You can even break these down into how willing am I to change eating habits? Okay, but then let's break that down a little bit more. Maybe you really lack your fruit and veggie intake. So rank those zero to 10. Are you willing to make changes to increasing your veggies, increasing your fruit? Maybe you are somebody who buys a lunch every day. Maybe it's uh, soda consumption or other things like that. You can break that down and rank those as well, one to 10. And that goes with our motivation and that goes with our activity habits too. This is so great because we truly need to believe that change is important and you need to have confidence that you can do it, which is why we rank these zero or one to 10. So I want you to rank all those questions. And before you move on, I want you to tell me what you have answered here. So if you answered less than eight out of in any of those areas, I want you to put those in one pile and then I want you to look at those and I want you to first identify as to why it was not greater than an eight. I want you to write it down and then I want you to set those aside. Then I want you to look at those questions that you ranked as greater than eight, eight or greater. Those are the ones that we're gonna start to look at in regards to setting our goals around. Whether it was regarding your stress, your sleep, nutrition, physical activity, making meal choices, maybe meal planning, meal prep, whatever it is, I want you to take those that you ranked an eight or greater, and I want you to focus on those for now, okay? So, now we know the areas that we can make improvements on, and we've already identified our why. We're gonna move into back to the basics next, but my final two questions for this section of readiness to change is, do you have the resources you need to make progress in your goals? What can distract you from reaching the goals on the ones that you set as eight or greater? Do you feel like you can overcome those obstacles? And do you feel like you can do this alone or do you need support? If you're not quite sure about these areas or the specific questions that you answered eight or greater, but you think that the obstacles can really bring you down from reaching those goals, I want you to set those ones aside as well and focus on the ones that you are ready to make changes to today, you know that you can overcome the obstacles easily and you feel supported with. You can either do it yourself at home. We have the support of family, friends, maybe a counselor, a dietitian like myself, your doctor, et cetera. And we're going to talk about 
two of those areas, which is often our nutrition and our physical activity next. Before you move on, if you want to pause in the video and really get those things set up before you move on to the next section, I think that is great. Otherwise, just make sure you come back to these two parts as we move forward. So we're going to talk about back to the basics for nutrition next. So immediately I go to thinking about the my plate and my pyramid. So when I was a kid, I learned about my pyramid. I learned it in grade school, but in 2011, we started using my plate, which is an easier, more visual way to balance your meals. And I think this is great for visual learners out there. I'm definitely a visual learner. So instead of having to me memorize, you know, I need seven to eight servings of this, two to three of this, four to six of this, if we can use the plate to look similar as to what this diagram shows for at least two out of three of our meals, we're sitting pretty. We're likely going to be meeting our nutritional needs for the general American here, too. So I'm going to go through each of these sections very quickly. Um, but first off, when we talk about the plate, it is a nine inch round plate. It is not the 13 inch plate that I have at home. It is we're looking at those that nine inch plate. And how we want to break this up is we want half of our plate to be non-starchy vegetables so or fruits. So uh, we're going to talk about what a non-starchy vegetable is a little bit later. A fourth of our plate to be protein, a fourth to be our starch or grains. And then, of course, we want one serving of fruit and one serving of dairy there as well. So let's break this down a little bit. So first off, I just want to give some examples. This first picture is a picture of just breaking it down into raw foods of what that looks like and how you would break that down. So as you can see, our non-starchy vegetables are in the bottom left corner, and then we've got our fruits on the right corner, or the right top corner, I should say. Then we have our left top corner, oh my goodness. Then we have our grains and our starchy vegetables over up on the top right corner and on the bottom we have our lean proteins and then we have the dairy in the corner there too. But this is how it could look for an actual plate once we cook that food out. So this is just an example, but we can even make a stir fry or casserole look like this before we actually put it together. So my example for a stir fry is you have the rice there, you could have the um, shrimp as this example and then you have the vegetables the non-starchy vegetables sitting in that one half of that plate if we can make that look like that raw we could dump that all in for our stir fry and cook it all together and then still have it meet the my plate standards as a mixed dish it's just one of my examples so my four Fruits and vegetables for the left hand side, or well, just half of our plate, let's say. We want half of our plate should be fruit and non starchy vegetables. If you've ever heard somebody say eat the rainbow, I think this is a great recommendation to get all those different vitamins and nutrients. But remember to look outside the box. I mean, some people say that they get sick of having the same fruits and vegetables, they just don't know what to put on their plate. So definitely look outside of the box for other fruits and vegetables that we just don't always have. Whether you want to go to a specialized grocery store or order it from somewhere special or a lot of local grocery stores nowadays have a more exotic food section, these are great areas to look at. Like kohlrabi, jackfruit, you know, bok choy. I recently started, I've eaten bok choy at restaurants, but I recently started cooking it myself and I absolutely love it. Okra, papaya, rambutan, you know, so many different food options out there nowadays. Then we have our grains and our starchy veg vegetable section, and this includes our potatoes, our winter squash, and our corn in this section. Unfortunately, it does it, it, these are not included in our vegetable section for the my plate standard. And if you want to, when you choose grains, for instance, we want to talk about having half of your grains being whole if you can. So there are two subgroups of our grains: our whole grains and our refined grains. Our whole grains are the ones that include the entire kernel, and our refined grains have been milled to remove the bran and the germ. A refined grain, when you do pick those, should be enriched if possible, so they add back in some of those nutrients that we lose when we refine grains. 
but they do lack the fiber. Unfortunately, we can't add back in much that fiber. So choosing whole grains will help getting us that fiber intake that we really do need to increase as Americans. We tend to only eat about half of the fiber that is recommended for the general American a day. So increasing our fiber a little bit by choosing whole grains is a great way to do this. Then we talk about our protein. We recommend lean protein, of course, which could be seafood, beef, pork, poultry, eggs, beans, peas, lentils, nuts, seeds, and soy products. Of course, the beans, peas, lentils can also be included in our starchy vegetable group. And when you do choose meats, we want to choose the low-fat lean cuts of meats, if at all possible, or making sure that you cut off the extra fat or drain the fat if you can. And when you choose seafood, cho choosing the ones higher in healthier fats like our omega-3s are great options for us as well. And if you're vegan or vegetarian, making sure that you choose beans, peas, lentils, nuts, seeds, and soy products often is great to make sure that we get some of those healthier fats and the nutrients that may be lacking if we don't choose those and we don't have any meat product in our diet. And then we're going to talk about dairy. Now, this unfortunately does not include our cream cheese, our sour cream, cream, and butter for those of us who really love those, but it does include our milk, our yogurts, our cheese, lactose-free milk, and fortified milk products. And of course, when you're choosing dairy products, try to choose the low fat or fat free products if you can for heart health to reduce our saturated fat intake. Although we do want to have saturated fat in our diet, we do want to limit that. So that was the my plate method. I know I went through it quickly. The next slide is going to have general nutrition recommendations for you, but by following the plate method, you can definitely reach your portion your portion goals much simpler. I do like to mention here though that if your portion if portion control is your goal, that is great. But if you generally eat, let's say three to four portions of an item per meal, cutting back to one portion is going to cause us some discomfort. So my recommendation is to cut back by one portion and then slowly decrease till you get to that one portion. My So I'll give you an example. An example is spaghetti. So oftentimes we eat more than the recommended amount of spaghetti per serving. So if you generally eat three cups of spaghetti in a sitting, try to decrease that down to two cups instead. If you can eat, eat the two cups and maybe increase by increasing your vegetable intake or just decreasing that, down to two cups instead, and then slowly decrease down to one portion. This would avoid your excessive weight loss and can also avoid any hunger pains or side effects that come with not eating enough or cutting back your portions too quickly. So by making small changes, small steps can really be a big impact for you in the end. Here's the general daily nutrition recommendations for our general women and men 18 years older. So you can pause here and take a look at this, but I always like to recommend going to myplate.org or .gov, excuse me, myplate.gov. If you would like some more information on what this looks like, they have some great visuals and great information for you on there. And remember that all of this depends on your age, your gender, and your goals. And these numbers may vary for you, especially if you have medical conditions as well. So make sure to check those out. Talk with your doctor too if they have any recommendations for you or meet with a dietitian. To get you started though, we did include some recipes. I absolutely love these. I've tried most of these myself, especially that winter grain bowl. As it gets closer to winter or when it gets closer to winter, this is some, these are some great options for you for fall. I also really like the no recipe meals and snacks, so you don't have to spend a lot of time cooking for those either. But so just some recipes for you to get started. The next section we're going to talk about is back to the basics. We're talking physical activity here. So 
benefits of physical activity. First off, I we know most of these, but I think they are really great to review. So first, they help maintain a healthy weight. That's why we're taking this class, right? They improve your strength, your endurance, your flexibility. There is some evidence that shows that we have longer lo our life longevity by increasing our physical activity, can improve our mood and quality of life, improve our sleep and help reduce stress, improve your nutrition choices. This is a new one that they're finding that those who increase their physical activity are more likely to make better food choices and of course can help prevent some chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, and some cancers. So the general recommendations for physical activity the requirement is at least 150, or the recommendation is at least 150 minutes. So that's about two hours and 30 minutes of exercise per week. So if you do a moderate intense exercise, which is what I would recommend to focus on most of the time, they recommend 150 to 300 minutes. Or if you are someone who really likes running a vigorous, intense anaerobic or aerobic, excuse me, activity, they recommend 75 to 150 minutes per week of that. So if we break down 150 minutes per week is about 20 minutes per day. So, you know, 20 to 40 minutes of physical activity per day, it doesn't seem too bad to me anyway. Most of us have 20 minutes in the day that we could break down and really focus on physical activity, but I'm going to give you some ideas because I like to break it up. I like to break up our general recommendations into two different groups, intentional movement and joyful movement, which we're going to talk about next. So I'm going to give you some tips here. So first off, I like to talk about intentional movement. That's movement when we decide to move. So we all have activities of daily living that we have to do, at least for the most part anyway. So why not turn these into activities that we can help reach our goals? So instead of thinking I have to do this, think I can also do this. So I like this picture of him. He's vacuuming, but he's having a fun time doing it, right? He's probably listening to music and he's jamming out, dancing while he's doing it. So that's something, well, I have to clean. Why not have a good time and dance along with it? That is physical activity. Cleaning is too. Standing while you're folding laundry, maybe doing squats while you're folding laundry is a good option there or jogging in place or walking in place doing a sitting bike while watching TV. I have one under my desk right here. And when I'm reading through my emails or reading articles or taking a class, I like to bike while I'm doing that. Taking the stairs instead of the elevator, parking your car farther away in the parking lot when you go shopping or going to work. These are just some great ideas of things that we have to do or we like to do anyway. So might as well get some physical activity and good heart pumping energy out of that. Then I change to joyful movement. So this is moving for pleasure, something that feels good to you. And it, I like to always mention that it might also be something that you disliked previously, but enjoy now. For instance, I hated running track when I was a kid. I So I thought I just completely hated running. I remember having to run around our gym like 27 times before to run the mile, and I absolutely <laughs> couldn't stand it. But I know now that I enjoy running on a treadmill, but I prefer walking outside. So it was something I disliked before. So please don't get bogged down by that. You might really enjoy it now. But some an activity that you look forward to doing. So I think of dancing with your significant other because you feel more connected to them. Maybe yoga because you feel refreshed afterwards. Walking your dog because you like now that energy that your dog gives you or walking out with your neighbors so you can gossip about you know something new that happened at work or happened in the neighborhood that day you know hiking to feel one with nature skiing because you like feeling the cool air on your face there are so many different options but remember when you're doing physical activity make sure to balance physical activity is all about balance we often hear that we need to run more to lose weight but that is not necessarily true Cardio burns a lot of calories, which is great, but then it makes us want to eat more. So what happens when you burn fast? Your body wants to recover faster and more 
often than not, when we we, we burn a lot of calories, we can lead to binging later. So making sure you incorporate the low to moderate or moderate intense exercise is great. So that's like strength training. So combining your cardio and strength training is absolutely great. What happens when we do more, when we focus on muscle training, we don't burn as many calories as fast. So that leads us to not have that intense hunger cue afterwards. Also, strength training helps with um, less muscle wasting and muscle sculpting and definition, but you can definitely in incorporate cardio into your exercise regimen. There is absolutely nothing wrong with cardio, but make sure to increase some of that muscle strengthening as well. Also, intentional movement and joyful movement. Add them all to our daily or weekly exercise regimen is absolutely great and it's going to help us reach our goals quicker. I also added a handout. It's a little bit older, but it is a great handout called 100 Ways to Add 2,000 Steps. It just gives you a few different ideas of how you can do that and incorporate these relatively easily into your day. I also recommend trying to incorporate this into your workday instead of sitting all day long. If you have a 15 minute break here or there, go for a walk around the building, going outside, maybe doing something in your office. There are so many different ways that we can incorporate activity into our daily lives. So now that we've gone through those a little quickly, we're going to really focus on setting our goals. So we have our why, we know where we can change, and we have all the resources that we need, and we understand the basics of physical activity and nutrition. So now we're going to change gears and focus on setting goals. So actually, we're going to focus on setting SMART goals, and this is one of the best ways to monitor our progress. So I want to talk about what I call the lowest hanging fruit method. So I want you to close your eyes or just look at this beautiful picture. Or just think about this example I'm going to give you. So you are at an apple orchard and you find the best looking apples on a certain tree. It's the ones at the top of the tree and they look so amazing, but you can't reach them, unfortunately. The apples on the bottom also look very good, but they just aren't as bright as the apples on the top of the tree. So what are you going to do? In order to reach the apples at the top of the tree, you need to do some things first. You can try to climb the tree, but you might fall. You can try to find a ladder, but then someone else could take the good apples first, or maybe you just can't find a ladder. You can try to find someone taller, but will they reach the apples that you want or maybe steal them from you? Or you could grab the apples at the bottom of the tree now, the ones that you know taste good, but just not quite as good as the apples at the top of the tree. And then you can come back when you are ready and prepared for the apples at the top of the tree. My point here that in order to get to the apples at the top of the tree, you need to do something first. You need to go, you need to take action in order to reach the top of the tree. So in order to re reach your ultimate goal, the apples at the top of the tree, you need to take steps to get there. In order to reach your ultimate goal with weight loss, maybe that's losing 50 pounds, we need to take steps to get there first. We need to reach for the lowest hanging apples and then take steps to get to the top. It takes steps to get to our ultimate goal and this is how goal setting should work. We start small. We need to make realistic and help, helpful weight goals when we're setting our goals. Our goals should be reachable, but we still need to work over our normal to reach our goals. They say if you can make changes to your lifestyle goals for greater than one year, you will likely succeed. If you cannot make those changes for greater than a year, you likely will not succeed in long-term weight loss. And then this is also just not realistic. So I think about those fad diets, the 90 days to this, give up this to get this, you know, any of those. These are unrealistic as we often cannot continue this for a lifetime, or at least most of us can't. 
I don't know about you, but I want to eat my grandmother's famous apple pie around Christmas. So if I stop eating carbs, I wouldn't be able to do that. I would have to give that up. If we can meet our small goals that we're going to set here quickly for at least 21 days, we are likely to continue them for a lifetime. So a realistic weight goal is about 10% of our baseline weight in six months. So that's up to about two pounds a week, for an example. So how do we reach these goals? We make behavior and have habit changes. They are the most sustainable ways to make lasting change. It takes 21 days to change it or to make a habit is the saying that I hear every once in a while too. A behavior and habit change is a task or a way of thinking that can continue, we can continue for the rest of our lives as second nature. So remember, consistent action creates consistent results. So let's talk about making some consistent changes. So I mentioned SMART goals earlier. I'm interested if you have ever heard of SMART goals. I'm sure you have. We've learned about these, or I know that I have learned about these quite often. SMART is an acronym for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time Bound. So the specific is the who, what, where, when, why, which. And we want to define when we set these goals, we want to define them as much as possible. Measurable is from and to. Can you track your progress and measure the outcome? Attainable is the how. Is this goal reasonable enough to be accomplished, but you still need to work towards it? It's more than I already do. Relevant, is it worthwhile? Is this goal worth it to be able to meet your goals? Is it gonna help you meet your goals? And time bound, that's your when. Your objective should include a time limit. So let's talk about some examples. These are specific as to what we need to do, right? I will bring my lunch to work three days out of five. They're measurable, a day in the week or time of the day. I'll exercise for 60 minutes, five days out of seven. They're attainable, so they want to be something that you are doing more than you're currently doing, but not too much more where you feel overwhelmed. You just want to have that sweet spot. So I like to go back to that bringing lunch to work three days out of five. Maybe you normally eat lunch at work or you go out for lunch five days a week. Now I'm going to do it. I'm going to make my lunches two days out of five or three days out of five because that's attainable for me. And then I will still be able to eat out or eat at work for the two days out of five. It's relatable. We know that eating out often increases our calories and our fat. And sometimes we often also will impulse what we eat. So by planning that out, it is relatable and it can help you reach your weight goals. And we know that it can make positive changes for you. And again, it's time bound. I will measure this per week. So you can stop here and look at these examples, but once we set our goals and we know that we can meet them for 21 days, we can build off of this. So maybe we increase to bringing a healthful lunch for four days out of the week. Maybe we go to sleep earlier or we can modify our goals. Instead of just exercising for 60 minutes, maybe you can break up that goal into at least 30 minutes of low to moderate intense exercise five days a week, or you can change it up a little bit here too. There are so many different examples that you can find online, but I urge you now to think back onto how to set those goals and start setting yours yourself here. And finally, I just this presentation is about finding sustainable ways to meet your goal, your weight goals. So I do not want you to feel discouraged if the number on the scale does not move as fast as you would like. Remember that quick weight, weight loss results often leads to quick weight gain. Our goals should be obtainable and a gradual weight loss, while we still preserve muscle mass that we can sustain for a very long time. Remember, we're taking this one step at a time. We often look towards the number on the scale to tell us if we're meeting our goals, but if we are being consistent, often the number on the scale is not the first thing that we notice to change right away. There are more in many ways to measure progress other than the number on the scale, especially as you save or even build your muscle and lose fat. So 
these are some of those ways that we can measure progress that I have written. I have written out here for you. And often you start to notice improvements in other areas before you see the number on the scale change. So make sure to keep these in mind as you go through this course. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that this presentation was helpful for you along while you go through this weight journey. Good luck and make sure you reach out as needed.